All right. Uh, I'm here with uh, Craig Packer. Uh, Craig, thank you for joining me today. You're very welcome. Um, so w some of the people I've talked to for this podcast have such unusual and unique jobs that like the first thing I want to know is like, how, how did they get started doing what they do? And in your case, uh, I came to know about you through your research on lions. Um, and I'm vaguely familiar with the story, but can you, can you tell me like, what, what exactly, how, how did you get involved in that? Well, so I was very, um, I don't know. I was sort of wandering through the late sixties. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, I had an opportunity uh, in 1972 to spend my semester abroad uh, in Africa uh, when I was an undergraduate. And uh, at the time, I was a pre-med student, and uh, I was thinking I was going to be going to medical school. But this opportunity came up so that I could go to Africa. And it was to work with somebody that I barely even knew about. Uh, her name is Jane Goodall. And um, wow. so when they said, anybody want to go and, you know, go to Tanzania uh, and work with uh, Dr. Goodall. And uh, she has uh, this long-term study uh, looking at chimpanzees and they do all this amazing stuff. And then uh, there, are, there are other opportunities there besides doing the stuff with chimps. And so I reckon that, uh, oh, that'd be pretty cool. I'd like to go to Africa because I really wanted to see a zebra. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's what compelled you. Be really cool, you know. Was Jane Goodall yeah. at this point, w was, she, was she renowned internationally or w was she just like another scientist? Uh, she was pretty well renowned already. Uh, she had appeared in a number of National Geographic uh, TV shows, and, and the magazine was a big thing in those days. And she'd yeah. been featured in a number of stories. Any anyway, rate, so I, I, I was kind of strategic because my primary goal was to go over there and eventually see a zebra, uh, not specifically to work with Jane Goodall and chimpanzees. So I said, so what else have they got going over there? And uh, so they were also trying to. Uh, develop a parallel program at Gombe on baboons, uh, which are these large monkeys uh, that are not nearly as interesting to people who obsess over early man. The idea has been for many years that if you look at our closest relatives, you might learn something about the origins of human behavior and chimps are our closest relative. But I thought, well, you know, if I'm gonna go see a zebra, uh, there'd be a lot of people wanting to do that. So I said, what else is there? And so I said, well, there's this baboon project. So I said, okay. Anyway, that's just how I got over there, which is kind of right. a whim. And then uh, the whole program of getting to Gombe was delayed. There was a lot of uh, problems in getting permits from the Tanzanian government to bring these students over. And uh, so I was at Stanford in time, and Stanford was trying to make sure they're doing everything right in terms of getting anything for the permits. And so by the time I went over, uh, I was not thinking. And uh, at the end of the time I was supposed to be there, that overlapped with when I should have gone off to medical school. Mm. So I was like, oh, I forgot to go to medical school. <laughs> I, as one does, <laughs> and, yes. Uh, and then, so I wrote to the medical school and I said, uh, can I come late? And they said, no. And I said, oh, okay. Wow. So I then decided to stay on extra uh, at Gombe. And by then, I actually got into the whole thing of studying animal behavior. I thought it was really interesting. So at this, sorry and, to interrupt, at, th at this point, you were already, because when you say like you're willing to delay or actually forego medical school, you were already like into like, okay, I want to see where this goes. It wasn't just like a whim, like, oh, I'm going to go to Africa for yeah. a semester. Well, it was, it was it was kind of a whim and being kind of so switched off that I didn't pay attention to the calendar or anything. Mm. But I was really absorbed in the work. And I just found uh, that watching these monkeys uh, doing fairly complicated things, it's like, oh my God, you know, these wild animals have very intricate and interesting lives. And so they have family dynamics, they have rivalries, they have friends. Uh, and they do a lot of really complicated things. And so um, 
when I fail, failed to get to, to medical school, uh, there were a number of graduate students who were at Gombe at the same time. And they said, oh, you should, you should go to graduate school. And so I said, oh, okay. So I ended up doing my graduate degree, my PhD on baboons, uh, on their behavior. And because in those days, there were no American universities that had such well-developed programs in animal behavior, I ended up going to England. And so I did my PhD at the University of Sussex. Uh, and then uh, after that, um, I just was so upset because it was really fun. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was intellectually very stimulating to, you know, why is it the animals behave this way? Because, you know, we're, we all grow up with cats and dogs, right? And what right. they do, we kind of assume it's because, you know, we're feeding them and they've got, you know, an interest in, in whatever it is their master wants. Well, for dogs, maybe not so much with cats. Uh, but you watch these wild animals and it's like, whoa, they've got their own motivations. They've got their own priorities and what dictates what they're going to do when. And so I got really caught up in, in with the baboons. Uh, they turned out to be quite cooperative animals. And so there were certain situations where the baboons are just sort of these monkeys wandering around in the forest would suddenly team up and act in unison uh, to do something. Uh, and so this little bit of cooperation uh, is a really important question in evolutionary biology because, you know, we're all used to the idea of nature red and tooth and claw, and it's every man for himself. But there are circumstances where some animals are really cooperative, like ants, you know, and social insects and stuff. Uh, but in mammals, it's really, really rare to see that kind of cooperation. And I was seeing it in the baboons. And a couple of years after that, I was still doing other work on primates, and the opportunity came up to uh, get involved with the Serengeti Lion Project. And lions, wow. And I did, you know, during those first year or so in Africa, I did actually get to see my zebra. Uh, and I Good did actually see lions. <laughs> And, uh, you know, my impression of lions was, oh my God, they sleep all the time and they're incredibly boring moment to moment. Um, and whereas the baboons, you know, they're monkeys, they're monkeying around with things, they're always doing something. So if you're trying to watch and get a sense of what makes them tick, you've got something to see. With lions, it's like, oh, you got to wait till they wake up, which is usually at night uh, and they're going to you know, stick to the tall grass, you might not get a good idea. But at any rate, the opportunity came up to uh, go back to Africa again uh, and study lions in the Serengeti. And the cool thing at that point was that the, this was in 1978, that uh, the lions had already been studied for about a dozen years. And in any population of wild animals, uh, if you go out and you just see all these animals, it's just a mishmash. But what happens if you get to know them as individuals is that, oh, right, the reason she's so uh, pissed off at that other monkey is because, you know, they're from different families or, you know, that's her older sister and she's just fed up with her, whatever. They're all that stuff that happens, you know, in any family, right. once you get the background. And so with the lions, 12 years was actually three whole generations. And so in going to Africa to see the lions, it's like, whoa, okay, not only do we know how sisters are with each other and brothers, but also, you know, grandmothers. And so many questions that we ask in biology when it comes to behavior really depends on how closely related any two individuals are. So that, you know, we all know that we're supposed to look after our own children, right? Sure. Because that's how our genes get into the next generation. But we should also be pretty nice to our nephews and nieces and even to our cousins. You know, if, if there's the right situation, then it might be a good thing evolutionarily to bias our behavior towards, you know, not even the closest, but some of our somewhat close relatives. And so all that was known in the lions. And so I thought, okay, that's a really cool thing. So that's what brought me out there initially was the interest in the intricacies of the behavior. And lions are so ridiculously intricate in their behavior because they hunt together. 
uh, and they raise their babies together. And you have a pride of females. You have a coalition of males. The coalition of males comes into a pride from somewhere else. All the babies are born at about the same time. The mothers pull them together in a creche, we call it, you know, a babysitting group. And they do all these things together. I mean, they'll nurse each other's young. Are, so are, are lions monogamous? No. So lions have a very complicated social system. So what's cool about lions, they're the only social cat. And their social system is really unique amongst animals. So instead of there just being a female by herself, which is the typical cat system, and a male that has a territory that overlaps the territory of three or four different females, you have groups of females that we call prides, and there can be up to 20 females in the same pride. And this is also what we call a fission fusion society. So they're not all 20 together at the same time in the same place, like a troop of monkeys. Right. It's much more spread out. And so you see a couple of three females together, and then the next day they're associating with somebody else, but they're only within that network of the pride. And so all the females within the pride uh, are able to breed, and they all have babies at about the same rate as each other, which is also really unusual. In most carnivores that are social, like dogs, spotted hyenas, and there's a couple of mongooses, meerkats and things, Usually it's just one female, like the alpha female, they call them the wolves. And they're the ones that do all the breeding. And there's an alpha male. But in the lions, there's no hierarchy. So you have this egalitarian society. It's almost unique in nature. And that's one of the things that's really appealing. You know, we like to think at our own society, how could it be more egalitarian? Uh, it's not. But compared to a lot of other species, we are. And so lions are truly a paragon in many ways in the way they organize themselves. Um, you, you were saying, uh, okay, so a couple of things that are going through my mind as you're saying that, um, that I want to touch on. One, when you said you were doing some wandering in the 60s, I was curious if that at all led to your identification with these communal living, non-hierarchical lions. <laughs> um, I don't Not know. so much. No? No? <laughs> okay. No, it, what's, you know, it's actually interesting. Uh, you know, most of those kinds of, I, I was not involved in any of those kinds of communes. Uh, I was certainly uh, indignant about government malfeasance. Right. And, you know, I wonder where are the protests today? But, um, so for sure that, but uh, otherwise, you know, the egalitarianism in humans seems to be our ancestral condition. Mm. Uh, if you look at bands of hunter-gatherer societies, so like uh, they used to be called the Bushmen, now they're called the San, the Khoisan that live in uh, the deserts of Kalahari, and there's some hunter-gatherers in, in, in the Amazon as well. Those societies are very egalitarian. And it's only, it seems, the result of uh, human societies evolving from these simple hunter-gatherer bands to larger societies, particularly where there's agriculture. And once you have agriculture, then there's real value in having land, handing it on to your children. And that has tended to lead to much more despotic social systems. So the origins of pharaohs and shahs and kings and emperors and all that sort of stuff happened after we became much more sedentary and we were much more uh, able to monopolize resources at the expense of our own kind. Yeah. So that, that sort of is how that's evolved. And, and you know, that wasn't what appealed to me in the beginning. Uh, I just happened to have come from that era. I think it's more that, you know, during those times, you didn't worry so much because, you know, it was the late sixties, early seventies. I mean, very, vibrant economy and i don't think people worried so much about you know making sure you can have a job once you get out of college mm -hmm. and so i think i was reasonably relaxed about giving up going to medical school and instead venturing off you know doing a, a graduate degree in animal behavior 
Yeah, and that that really sucks that that's not the case so much anymore because it's yeah. you know the amount of like dynamism in young people is definitely got to be reduced. If it's like, oh my god, I have two hundred thousand dollars in student debt, you know, I'd love to get into social services or something like that, but I I have to I have to get a higher paying job. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that was going through my head was when you said that cooperative behavior is not as um, prevalent in mammals it, mm -hmm. as opposed to like insects, which are like much dumber creatures. Mm -hmm. So why, why is that? Is it? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a very interesting question. So the social insects, um, they're not egalitarian. I mean, they're the exact opposite. They're about as despotic as you can get because there's a queen Mm, oh yeah. she's doing all the reproductions. I mean, she's literally the ovaries for the entire colony. And so um, it's very despotic, but the, what has happened in those situations is that there may be uh, certain circumstances in the environment. So let imagine it's, it's like, it's a very patchy environment and there's some places where you can thrive. And if you don't have access to that very rich area, you're not going to do so well. And so in ants and bees and things, uh, if you have certain circumstances where you can um, gain access to, um, to these very rich areas, and then you can uh, manage to get the reproduction as you as an individual, and you have all your daughters doing all your, the work for you, it's very common in social insects because they have a very weird genetic system that is really weird. So male bees, the drones, they're the result of virgin birth. So an How egg so? that is not fertilized yeah. remains yeah. in the haploid state, but it grows up and it becomes a male. Whereas daughters are the result of sexual reproduction. So the mother mates with one of these drones. And so her haploid egg is restored to the diploid state. Okay. So her daughters, weirdly enough, through that genetic system, it's very complicated to explain, but they're actually more related <laughs> to their sisters than they would be to their own offspring. And so in terms oh. of getting your genetics into the next generation, there's a bias there in that female bees, female ants can say, oh, I'm a worker. Well, that's not so bad because <laughs> right. I can help my mom to produce a lot more sisters and then I'm getting a lot more genes out there. So it's a combination of kind of uh, environmental circumstances that force them to work together then they have this weird genetic system where, well, one of the best ways to do that is to help mom produce more sisters. So mammals, we don't have virgin birth, at least not on a regular basis. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so there's not that bias for females to want to have more sisters rather than more offspring of their own. So that's one thing for this eusociality. Another, because we're so smart, uh, and because we can do so many things, um, there are just a lot of circumstances where uh, individuals can just get away with being more selfish, basically. Mm -hmm. And so there's some circumstances, so like with the monkeys, um, they don't cooperate that much, uh, but they're kind of forced to live in these groups, again, because of the patchy environment. And it's enough to be in that group sharing those resources they can still be kind of bitchy with each other about it yeah <laughs> and the cool thing about the lions is that they come back to that situation again where it's kind of a patchy environment and they have to defend like the water hole or the series of water holes that are close together as a group to be able to monopolize whatever prey might wander into that area and so they have then uh an incentive to be cooperative that just happens to be much higher than most other species. And because they're so dangerous that no one female is going to end up being able to 
sort of cow her sisters into being subordinate. So they're all going to end up, they end up in a kind of a, a situation of mutually assured destruction. It's so costly to fight over. You're telling me I can't have babies <laughs> and they'll fight back. Right. Yeah. So they've got this kind of, it's a, it's an interesting kind of situation. They're kind of nuclear partners, but because you've got these groups cooperating against other groups, it forges this very strong sisterhood. Interesting. That's when you were talking about the fact that the more intelligent creatures can get away with being more selfish. I was talking to, uh, to Chomsky about that. And you're saying that it's possible that intelligence in many ways is an almost lethal mutation where you, you look at the more successful species, it tends to be like insects. And uh, only recently were humans, you know, skyrocketing in terms of their population. Did, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, you know, the thing that, there have been so many things over the years. I mean, I can remember when I first went to Gombe uh, and working with Jane, you know, she had dispelled one of the definitions of humanity in that for the longest time, people felt, scientists felt you could distinguish humans from other species because we were the only animal to use tools. Mm. And so, you know, one of our uh, ancestral species, Homo habilis means handyman. And so it's a member of our own genus, Homo. And the thought was, you know, habits, oh yeah, first tool users, right? Well, when Jane was there back in the early 60s, she saw chimps using tools. It's like, oh. Now, since her first observation, a lot of animals have been seen to use tools, but you know, she she was at the she was the head of the curve there and saying, no, humans are not unique on that. So through time, what we've seen is more and more things like that, that, oh, humans are unique because, you know, uh, no, if you look harder, other animals do the same thing. And so through time, what I think I'm left with anyway, is the sense of uh, how do we view the future? And humans don't discount the future as much as most animals do. And what I mean by that is that most selfish actions, and, that, and we're, we're capable of being real assholes, no doubt yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when we're being an asshole, we're generally discounting the future. We're so caught up in the moment that for, we forget how bad that's going to look or what kind of consequences it might have in the future. And most of the time with most animals, they're in that eternal now. There's something, I want it, I grab it right now. Yeah. And... A lot of experiments on animals show that they really don't think that far into the future. Okay. And you know about the marshmallow test, right? You know, the marshmallow test yes. is you've got a waiting room and you, you know, it's actually an experiment. You tell some kid, okay, you're going to see so-and-so you wait here. Oh, but by the way, if you, you know, there's a bowl of marshmallows, right? On the table in front of the kids. So if you uh, can hold off, when getting into the, marsh the marshmallows uh, for, you know, so long, we'll give you a, a prize of some sort, okay? Or you get more marshmallows or however it works. And so, you know, study after study shows that there's some kids who just can't do it. They're so impulsive, right? Uh, and they just can't get that if they would wait, you know, three minutes, 30 seconds, whatever it is, right. they would get a bigger reward. So they're impulsive. So that impulsivity, as we see in humans varies from individual to individual, but if you compare it to animals, no animal could pass the marshmallow test. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they're all in the eternal now. And so what I think about with humans, getting back to the gist of your question, which is, you know, do we have a future? As bad as we seem to be, and we're, a lot of that's playing out right now. I mean, I'm working at home, you're working at home. Right. We've got public health people we're really wanting us to hold off, right? And then we also have people who impulsively wants to get back to work right now because the economy's collapsing. And people have got their own motivation about where they're going to be on that spectrum between, you know, the public good and the private good, right? I mean, some people are, are harmed much worse by their loss of jobs, obviously, depending on what your employment is. And so people are in different situations. But if you had us as animals, 
everybody would be out there. There'd be no point, <laughs> yeah. there, right? Yeah. Forget about it. All now, 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 now. So the fact that we can do this as much as we have, and you know, the, the virus doesn't lie. The virus, you know, as a lot of people have said, we have to find out what the virus is. And the virus is showing us that all around the planet, most people have modified their behavior so that the rate of infection really has diminished over what it could have been if we'd carried on business as usual. Right. So I think that's a tremendous, you know, that's a great advertisement for the human race. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, as a lot of people have said, things are going to get a lot worse with climate change. And there are going to be more crises. And unless we, you know, unless we learn from this pandemic and we have more tools, like we stockpile testing kits, we stockpile swabs, or whatever it is we're going to need for the next one. Uh, you know, if we do that, it might not be so bad. And even with climate change, even if they become more frequent, we'll also have the fact that, you know, some of the vaccines that are in development may not be so specific to coronavirus. Some of the treatments may not be unique to one virus, but they might be broad spectrum, kind of like antibiotics are. And so I think human behavior <clears throat> shows a responsiveness that we shouldn't despair over, despite what we see on the, on the cable news with extreme behavior and technology. And we're seeing a lot of cooperation and collaboration between different labs that's really quite unprecedented. A lot of people are viewing what a year ago in terms of virological studies would have been the private good of, oh, I've got a new treatment, I'm gonna get rich off of it. Right. More of a sense of, well, this is a public good, right? Maybe we all need to be able to do this, right? And so there are these things that I think should actually give us hope that our species is gonna persists far longer than people think. And I don't think that any other species would be able to do that. I think any other species would just be subject to periodic outbreaks. They just obviously, you know, they don't have the technology, obviously, but they also yes. don't have, they don't have the willing, the lack of impulsiveness, the willingness to quarantine themselves. Well, I, I hope you're right. The only, the only thing that, um, that, I, that I guess I, that kind of sticks for me there is that, the lack of the ability to be in that eternal now, which is very much something like a Buddhist monk would say we should strive for. Um, and th that same inability to be in the now is also what has created in many ways, the means of our destruction. I mean, when you were talking about uh, creating out agriculture uh, earlier uh, when we were talking and how that, you know, sort of laid the foundation for a lot of despotic societies. Okay, well, you can't plant grain unless you're willing to um, delay gratification. So I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I, I get what you're saying, but on the one hand, you know, we wouldn't, we, we, no other animal would create a problem like climate change on their own, right? Well, you know, that's another question. So, um, Given what we've done to the environment, let's go back to Africa and let's go back to animals. Yes. What we've done to the environment, there are a lot of people who would say that there are some species that are exploiting the limited space that is left for them to the extent that, oh, we need to do something about it. And the classic example of that is the elephant, the African elephant. Yes, I've heard and about this. So, until, until the poaching crisis uh, in the late 1970s in East Africa, there were a lot of people, and they actually did cull elephants in Kenya because the elephants being confined now to these national parks, which is just a fraction of their original range, they're now crowding together in smaller areas, knocking down all the trees. And when a drought came along, boom, they're in real bad trouble, okay? Uh, later on, then people stopped saying we should cull elephants because the poachers were, you know, getting rid of the problem for the conservationists, so they didn't say it anymore, outside of South Africa. South Africa, 
they kept saying the same thing. Oh, we got too many elephants because they didn't have a poaching crisis. And the elephants are knocking down all the trees. We should cull them. And so there's a lot of debate as to whether the uh, situation was as bad uh, as the wildlife managers claimed in either East Africa or South Africa to truly justify the culling. But I think at least in some cases, yeah, they do knock down all the trees. And so they are going to over, you know, they're going to strip their environment of the necessary resources. And we've certainly seen that in other cases. There's the famous study of uh, caribou uh, in a small island of Alaska uh, where they were introduced to this island and life was great for the caribou to begin with because there's all this lichen and they're chomping away and they're having babies and they just outstripped everything. And lichen is very slow growing. So that was a cumulative resource that they basically overconsume, and then they all starve to death. So the population mm. crashed. So animals do that. And so th that's called a uh, density dependent population regulation. And you can have circumstances where you hopefully going to reach kind of what's called a carrying capacity and things stay fairly stable there. But there are known cases where species have overshot and then crashed. Right. And so we're, we're looking like we're doing that in a way that is so hard for most people to appreciate and conflicts with the way a lot of very influential people earn their livelihood. Oh yeah. Getting back to the inequalities. <laughs> no, 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 of course. That's, it, it's, it's interesting that you say that because um, when, you, you know, I, I was talking to this other uh, ecologist the other day and he was, um, he was very much of the opinion that, when humans developed agriculture, that was the first major tragic mistake of our species. And that um, he, he was almost, uh, it was a good conversation, but he, he was almost kind of putting down uh, humans, like where, you know, where these miserable pieces of shit and all these other animals are basically still living in the Garden of Eden, you know, innocent and, unt but you, clearly you don't feel that way. Well, you, wouldn't, you would not want to live the life of an animal. I mean, most animals have 50, 60% infant mortality. Is that what we want? You know? Right. I mean, we've crossed to so many new expectations now. I mean, look at the extraordinary medical interventions that we make, you know, for people who can afford it. You know, every, every wanted fetus should reach the age of 100, you know, and that's crazy in terms of history. Doesn't make it ethically wrong, but it's just to so totally different. For anybody who wants to live like animals, you know, the chance, I mean, what, there's 7.8 billion people on earth? How many pe millions would there be? You know, the human population for agriculture was only, I think, in the 100 million. So 90% of us wouldn't even be here to have this discussion. You know, yeah. We're only here because of agriculture. And the fact is that agriculture is not as evil as people want to make either. So I happen to be working with some economists right now and some other ecologists. And we're looking at what's happening to the Earth's land. We're very interested in how much land is left su to support the remaining biodiversity. And we know that forests are being cleared in some countries uh, for agriculture uh, or for um, even for ranching, right? Um, and what we see in our data, if you look at the whole world, that's true. We're still clearing uh, forests. We're still clearing land so that we can feed all of us with our agriculture and also that we can feed our cattle because more and more people want to eat meat. And, you know, that's a conflict with what's left in nature as well. There's also many places where we're using agriculture to feed our cars. So Iowa and places, a lot of the ethanol is for transportation. So all these things are going on. But if you look across the planet, what is happening is that to meet this growing demand for resources, there's two strategies, and we divide these strategies 
into those involved in extensification. So you have more extensive agriculture, you have more land using the same techniques, or you rely on intensification. And intensification means of the land you've already set aside for agriculture, what is your yield? How many bushels of wheat, how many, you know, whatever, how many kilos of cocoa, whatever you're growing off the land. Sure. So what you see is in the wealthier countries, it's intensification. So the yields have gone up, okay? And if you divide the world according to its wealth, what we see is that's true with the richest countries. And you go in each tier down because the World Bank you know, classifies a country as you know, the wealthiest, uh, upper middle, lower middle, et cetera, all the way down to the lowest. And all of those tiers of economic classification are showing rapid improvement in yields to meet the needs. It's only in the lowest of the low in terms of their economic classification. The poorest countries, they're still relying on extensification. So where we're seeing rainforest being chopped down in Democratic Republic of Congo or Gabon, some of these other countries in Africa, these are very, very poor countries. And so that leaves us with the challenge then of, well, hey, wait a minute, what we're seeing is you can get much more bang per buck through intensification. And you can even do this with less fertilizer. You can do it with less of the pollutants that used to be such a huge problem. Now there's still too much nitrogen deposition. There's still too much reliance on these kinds of inputs. But if they're done appropriately, you can actually improve the efficiencies. So long way of saying, it depends on where you're talking about and is it hopeless? And we don't think so. We think there's still time. Uh, hopefully, you know, things are gonna be set back right now because of the pandemic. But hopefully when the world economy gets humming again in a couple of years, there are lessons that could be hopefully applied to some of the poorer countries so that they too can switch over from extensification, chopping everything down to intensification getting more yield off the land you've already set aside. And what we know from the US, just, just to put this in perspective, is that if you go back to the 1800s, there's now much less land in the US under the plow than there used to be. Because Iowa is so incredibly efficient, you know, a lot of land, especially uh, in the Eastern states, that's not profitable to grow crops in anymore. So you have your hippie communes or you have your, your small colleges or whatever else right. can use that land and you can actually reforest it. There's been a lot of reforestations in the US. And so those trends we hope will happen all over the world. And so it's, it really isn't too late. Well, that's good. I'm glad that at least one smart person can be hopeful on this podcast that everyone else has been doom and gloom. So thank you. <laughs> um, the, uh, when you're talking about the amount of wildlife uh, preserves being shrunk over time, um, there's kind of this like romantic uh, yearning for just open wildlife. And I, I remember I was on like a boat when I was in like eighth grade and we were out to sea and we looked around and it was just all ocean. And it was a really um, beautiful moment because it was like, wow, there's no humans here. Um, but you go anywhere on land and you're not going to get that. Um, do you, so w w in terms of lions, w what, is, um, what is their situation in terms of like their conservation status? Uh, where are they able to go? Are they all basically just in national parks now or, or what's, what's the status there? So essentially, uh, they are in uh, landscapes that have been set aside either as a national park uh, or a some sort of game reserve. These different kinds of protected areas have different names, different labels, and different kinds of protective status. So in a national park in Africa, it's pretty much like a national park here. You can't go and you know build a house <laughs> or you know make a farm. Uh, so that's the highest protective status. 
there are a lot of other areas in Africa that are kind of in the middle somewhere where uh, the wildlife is meant to be protected, uh, but people may live, uh, provided they engage maybe in only limited activities. Uh, so in a lot of drier parts of Africa, people earn their livelihood through pastoralism, meaning they live on livestock, uh, either cattle, or increasingly because of climate change, more on goats. Um, so that the, the land there is too dry to grow crops. So the only way you're gonna get food out of the land is to have a grazer eat it, <laughs> uh, eat the grass, and then you can harvest the meat. And so in those areas, there are still lions. So in the parks themselves, um, ah, there's issues and there, there's, this is gonna be, I may not be quite so optimistic about lions as a species here. Yeah. In many of those uh, national parks, they are immediately adjoining agricultural areas. And so there's enough rainfall that people can be growing uh, maize or cotton and maize is what everybody in the world calls corn outside of the US. Uh, so they're either growing a food crop or some other crop. Um, and the wildlife may be attracted to those fields. And so there's huge conflict. And so there's more and more of a need to have physical barriers between uh, the parks and the people in those agricultural areas because there's really nothing for the wildlife to do out there except get in trouble, eating people's crops. I mean, an elephant can go out and wreck a whole family's livelihood for a year, just in one night. Yeah. So that's, that's really problematic. But if you go on the drier side, they can't grow crops. And instead they're relying on pastoralism and livestock. And in those situations, you still have problems with lions because lions, again, they may produce more offspring than can possibly survive in an area. And so rather than starving to death because there's no wildebeest for me because all the other lions are eating wildebeest here, ah, uh, what's that over there? When they leave the park and there's a cow. And that was easy. <laughs> that was really easy. And they do it again. And so then that's really hitting into people's livelihoods. And these pastless communities tend to be very, very poor. It's not a, it's not the best option. And if it's you and me, I'd much rather, you know, have 40 acres on one side where I could grow a crop than, you know, hoping that my goats are going to give enough food for me and my family. I mean, it's, it's really risky, especially drier weather and everything. So those are the people that can least afford to have this perturbation, this disruption to their livelihood. And so, of course, they retaliate. And so they may spear the lions, uh, depending on, you know, if they're Maasai, who still do that sort of thing with spears. More commonly now, we see people using poison. Uh, that's very common throughout Africa. Uh, the lions have killed a goat or a cow uh, and is not at the carcass at the moment. It's hiding in the bushes during the daytime. So people go out, just lace the carcass with poison, wait for the lion to come back, boom. So that's do really people problematic. eat lions? No, they don't eat lions. Um, I'll get to that in a second, but let me just finish on this. Sure, sure, yeah. On, that's on that's the problem, and what is the solution? And so there are a number of projects that have started out in the last uh, seven or ten years to work with local people. So conservationists are going out working with these pastors people and helping them do a better job at protecting their livestock against the lions. So that if they don't lose the cow in the first place, then there's no reason to retaliate. And so there are some success stories on that, at least so far, uh, that people have, have been able to improve the uh, husbandry practices to the extent that, that the local pastoralists are saying, okay, lions are cool. And the lions are bringing enough tourist revenue uh, because tourists would come to see the lions either in the national park itself or even in their own areas that that provides jobs. So that provides an incentive for people to live with lions. So that's the positive side of that, except for the pandemic. Uh, and yeah. So everything shut down and who knows how long it's going to be shut down for. This could go on for years as a major impact on the, on the national parks, 
on the conservancies that are involved local people in the management of wildlife in these pastless areas. And that that's, we're just gonna have to see how that plays out. My latest communications with folks I know who work in those areas is it's bad right now because there's just yeah. no, there's no tourist revenue. And so those people who were being employed now don't have jobs. <clears throat> so there's gonna have to be an alternative. Then you mentioned, do people eat lions? No, they don't directly. But there is this weird thing that's happened in the last dozen years or so. In China and Asia, so Vietnam, Laos, China, there are traditional medicines. So in the same way that we saw uh, with the uh, wet market in Wuhan, that there were uh, weird wildlife species like pangolins. Uh, some of those are there as food. Sometimes they're there as medicine. And one of the weirder medicines uh, is tiger bone wine. And tiger bone wine is supposed to have various medicinal properties. Uh, and so that's been a, a source of some of the poaching in Asia of tigers for their bones. Well, there are very few tigers in Asia left. There's been more protections looking after the few remaining tigers. Meanwhile, in South Africa, there has been this very weird thing down there where people who have ranch land, instead of raising cattle or goats, they're raising wildlife. And one of the species they've been more or less farming there is the lion. And the lions there can be shot uh, by mostly Americans, tourist hunters, in a, in a kind of a thing called canned hunting. Right. And the canned hunting uh, is, uh, sorry, my coffee delivery system just arrived. Thank you, no. coffee delivery system. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, so, sorry, so canned hunting is where uh, mostly Americans and some Europeans would pay $20,000 to go to South Africa to shoot a lion that had been raised on one of these lion farms. Okay? Right. And so there has been less of a demand for canned hunting because the US government during the Obama administration banned the importation of trophy lions from these canned facilities. Mm. So here are these guys with all these lions, they're feeding them, you know, horses and cows that have we're going to be killed anyway at, at an abattoir, but they're still expensive. And so they're trying to make a buck because that's the business, right? Right. So one of the things they said was, Hey, China, Vietnam, Laos, how about lion bone wine? Oh, wow. So they just and made up all these bones. Yeah. And so for the last few years, they've been exporting thousands of lion skeletons to Asia. And so you can get, uh, it, I think in some cases, it's still called tiger bone, but when you read the, the, the ingredients, it says, you know, made with lion bones, even though it's called tiger bone wine. And so uh, anyway, that has now created demand for lion bones that did not exist 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, and now it's there. And when this first happened, a lot of us were hoping that the demand would be met entirely by these captive lions. And that would leave the wild lions alone. But in the last couple of years, there's growing evidence now that, well, hey, you know, we, we don't want any lions around here because they're eating our cows, they're a pain in the ass. And we can sell their bones. So now we got another incentive to kill the lions. Wow. Yeah, that's a. Uh... It's weird that the the rarest animals seem to have like the most purchase as a as an exotic medicine, you know, like lions or bald eagles. Like no one's no one's taken pigeon bone broth, I suppose. Um, well, but I think they're also trying. I think they're also trying to get the reflected glory. I mean, you know, I will be as mighty as a pigeon. You know, yeah, <laughs> I have the talons of a of a pigeon. Where's yeah, the popcorn? You know? <laughs> I see. Yeah, trying to imbibe the spirit. Wow, yeah. that's uh, 
Okay, so the lions are not, uh, their population is a little shaky. Oh, one of the things I wanted to ask you is you had gone into, um, I'm probably going to pronounce the name wrong, but like the, the Chau Chauvet, Chauvet yeah, uh, Chauvet, Caves. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? That, that, that was so, I mean, yeah. people very rarely go in there. Yeah. No, it was amazing. Um, as it happened, um, uh, so I was first approached by the French culture ministry uh, to look at some photographs of uh, these new cave paintings that were discovered whenever it was about 20 odd years ago, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, they asked me what I thought of them. And I thought, wow, these are amazing uh, because they were so lifelike. And they just popped to me because I'd seen African lines uh, showing some of the same behaviors that the French artists had painted 36,000 years ago. And that was, technically it's a different species. It's called Panthera spelia or Atrox. There's different names, but it's the cave lion, uh, but definitely a lion. And um, so I saw these pictures and it just like, wow, this is incredible. And so- um, well, Sorry, I what, what, what you said they were depicting the behavior of the lions. What, what, what do you mean? Yeah, so- um, there was um, there was a pair of lions walking in tandem, so two lions walking side by side, and uh, basically, you know, it's like they're in profile, and so you could see one slightly behind the other. Yeah. And uh, the the French themselves, mostly being artists, were thinking that that was just kind of a funny extra outline. And I said, no, 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 that's a male and a female. Because the one that's behind uh, with a larger outline uh, has slightly different dimensions, but it also has a scrotum. You can see its testicles. Wow. And the one in the front does not have a scrotum, does not have testicles. That's a male and a female. And they yeah. said, oh, okay, cool. And um, we had seen that same behavior. And if you're lucky, I mean, you might see that same behavior in African lions, that if a female is in heat, if she's receptive, uh, that one of the males in the pride uh, will try to monopolize her through her, her estrus period. And if she starts to move somewhere, he'll actually walk right side by side, shoulder to shoulder. And he's kind of trying to veer her off in one direction so that she doesn't go off to another, another male. And that's what this showing in that cave painting is like, wow. And there were other things like that. <clears throat> and so we just got into a conversation. And then a few years after that, uh, I was invited just fortuitously to a conference in Paris. And, uh, and I was still in communication with them. And I said, oh, I'm going to be coming over. Said, oh, would you like to see the cave? And I said, yeah. And, uh, and so we went from Paris down to uh, the Ardèche Valley. And uh, it was a big thing going in. I mean, you know, I, I was there on honeymoon and I was hoping my wife would go with me, but they wouldn't let her in, which was not a good start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, she delivered the, you know, anyway. So uh, the um, uh, cave to get into it had for the time, the ultimate high tech security. I mean, I'd never seen this anywhere else, but <clears throat> there was a, there was one way to get into the cave and it had this electronic surveillance thing. And um, there were like palm prints, it was like palm print, print recognition. And there were like, I don't know, three or four people on earth whose palm had been fitted on this. So they're the only people who could possibly unlock the door to go in. Wow. And uh, the reason for that, uh, well, besides obvious from vandalism, which would be horrific, but there are there are bad people out there. You know, we, the human race may be better on average, but we got our bad elements. Um, so, you mean people who might want to steal the paintings or something like that? Well, or just going in to face them. You know, people do horrible things. Yeah, yeah. You know? That that's at the worst case. But even in the best case, where people just go in, there's another cave, uh, La, uh, Lascaux, which is very famous for its cave paintings that are, they're like 12,000 years old, um, but it's been open to tourism. And so many tourists went in that in our breath, 
we're breathing in and out. As we know, our breath carries microorganisms. And this contaminated the cave walls. And she started getting these growths of fungus and algae and things that actually, you know, they were destroying the, the surface of the paintings. So to prevent that from ever happening in Chauvet, they were trying to restrict it to a very, very minimum number of people. And so I was the, I think I was the fifth non-French person allowed into that cave or something. And they, they'd contacted me because I was, you know, kind of an authority on lions. They'd also contacted an authority on, on some of the other species. Anyway, I was the lion expert. Yeah. And so we went in to see everything. And it just, it was just a profound experience because, I mean, if you've ever been into any cave, you go in and you, you, you kind of, you have to kind of crouch down a little bit. And there's just this silence, you know, and there's just this sort of aura of anything when you see the walls. And, you know, the, the lighting there, again, was very restricted because they didn't want algae starting to grow on the walls or anything. So things were just, you know, we, he had a, a lamp and he'd light things up. And I'd say, oh, my God. And again, you know, seeing them in person, it just made it much more impressive because you can't tell how big they are from photographs. Yeah. And they're really big. And so, you know, they're, they're more or less life size. And so what struck me about these, these I, I want to call them photographs. I mean, they, they are, they're like literally paleolithic photographs of lion behavior. And they chose certain things uh, to portray. So they had that mating pair. And, you know, that passageway where the mating pair is, it's very narrow, and you, it's very close to you. You look at it from only a, a few feet away. And so it's this big, impressive, you know, life-size lion drawings. But to go into that very near passageway, it's kind of Freudian uh, because at the entrance of that passageway, because, you know, you, you have any cave and there's kind of broader openings and then narrowings. In that particular narrowing, there, one of the few portrayals of anything human at all is of a woman's vulva. So you're literally like having your Freudian moment, you know, in this birth passage going into this narrow thing. And there's a mating pair of lions on the wall. Oh my God. Ordinary. That that do you think that was intentional? Like all those yeah, bits of imagery? Yeah. Anything, yeah, I don't think that was accidental. And you know, and they didn't show the sex act itself with the lions, but those were lions who would be mating. Oh my God. So, <laughs> that, that's like that that's not just people like drawing cartoons on the wall that's like legitimate aspirations to art where you're you the passageway like a birth canal like that's amazing Thirty six thousand years ago wow you know it, it's another what thirty thousand years before we even have the pyramids you know? <laughs> yeah so yeah it's mind-blowing and so there were other things like that and you know of, of and, and with that one again that pair was so informative because that would have been an adult male with an adult female the male did not have a mane. So, ah, aha, you know, it's a very similar species, Panthera atrox or Panthera spelia, depending on your taxonomy. Uh, we could see from other pictures that they're showing groups of lions confronting prey. So it looks like they're a social species, just like the modern lion is a social species, but they don't have manes. So we learned a lot of biology just from those, those photographs. But my favorite of all in there was of two lions. And in this case, it, it might be between two males, actually, uh, that, because males do have dominance. Females don't. They're egalitarian. Males are a bit more despotic. Sweet. And, <laughs> yeah. Go figure. Uh, but the, there's two lions, and there's a dominant one who's got this very imposing posture uh, and another one that's crouching. And the one that's crouching is snarling in a very defensive uh, facial expression. And the one that's the dominant one's got its ears back and making a very kind of assertive kind of uh, approach towards the other. I mean, it's astonishing. Again, it's a photograph of animal behavior from 36,000 years ago. And so what I think blew me away more than, I mean, A, this the technical abilities to get that down really talented artist what they chose to show was purposeful in some way and obviously these guys knew as much about lines as i did and you know i i 
sat in the Serengeti for many years. I've had many students out there and we followed those lines for decades. And, you know, we always watched them through binoculars from a vehicle 36,000 years ago, no glass, no wheel, <laughs> Yeah, you know, so these guys are seeing this in person and they're close enough to see the ears going back, the snarling faces. It's extraordinary. And so uh, it put into a context for me of what it must've been like living there. They were this cave, the entrance to the cave is uh, on the side of a cliff. And so I s assumed that the artist would have watched the lines from the safety of his perch or her perch was probably a man. Um, Why do you say that? Well, just because I think in, in those days, um, I think the women would have been so bound up because there would have been hunter gatherers. And I just don't think the women would have had that much spare time to, mm -hmm. to become that kind of artist. And I mean, I could be wrong, but you know, and it'd be great if it was a woman, but I'd, I'd be kind of surprised just because yeah. I think, you know, in, in hunter gatherer societies, the men often just sit around. Uh, and, and, and you see that in a lot of societies, men just sit around, women do all this work. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's what inspired me to say that. So I will say he, cause I think it probably was a man. Sure. But uh, he was sitting up, up there with time in his hands cause the women are off actually running everything. Mm. <laughs> but he could, he could safely see uh, what was going on from his perch up there. And he had reason to. The reason for watching the lions is that if they're taking down these whacking great things like woolly rhino and you know mastodons or whatever else they had, I mean they had really big scary things. Humans that had been really hard to do, but if the lions caught something and they feed for a while, then they're pretty easy to chase away. And so hunter gatherers do that still. Uh, if they find the lions, uh, we've, we've done a project recently in Botswana where they're really good at, at tracking lions in the sand. And I said, how come you guys are so good at tracking the lions? Well, we want to know, you know if they've caught something. And I said, so you can chase them away and eat it. And said, yeah, yeah, of course. It's a way of getting protein. It's a free meal. So 36,000 years ago, my assumption is, and again, this would be a male thing because they do more of the hunting. Yeah. Um, that he would be one of these men who would be involved with carving off the hunk of meat, bringing it back. So he had a reason, he had a very strong reason to be interested in animal behavior. He had a really strong reason to be interested in the lions in particular. That is, uh, yeah, that, that's an amazing, like just to, to imagine that scenario and the fact that the art was so uh high quality is like what the the one thing that i was wondering when you were saying that is what as a biologist why do you think it is that the the men are sitting around and then have these like big bursts of activity and like a hunt or something like that some like really risky uh you know activity and the women just have like a steady stream of work is there any like evolutionary reason for that or because yeah, a lot of people I mean, would be like oh this is just uh you know people being forced into these positions and how lucky you are to just sit around and do nothing right well i think this comes back to if you actually watch chimpanzees orangutans gorillas um you know the the the, the babies are totally reliant on their mother's milk and so the mother has to be in proximity with her baby. And uh, as the baby is weaned, uh, we know from studies of chimps uh, that you know, the, the, the mother may spend quite a lot of time on her own with her offspring. Their offspring are really dependent on their mothers uh, until they might even be 10 years old or so. And so, but they're the ones, they're always with um, their mothers and the males uh, are doing things like, you know, patrolling the edge of the territory. They tend to do more of the hunting. Uh, females do hunt some, but they rely for animal protein. Female chimps rely a lot more on um, termites, speaking of social insects. 
Hmm. So they'll actually take twigs, poke them into a termite mound, wait for the soldiers to clamp on, pull it off. And, and so that's a very steady, constant supply. And that's what their babies need. And so with the males, uh, you know, they don't catch a, a monkey or a, a small buck every day. That's more occasional. It's also risky. Sometimes they have to leap through the trees. Uh, it can be fairly acrobatic sometimes when they're catching their prey. And if you've got a, you know, if you've got a nursing child, so these things are going to definitely lead to a divergence in childcare and um, the kinds of activities that each sex is engaged in. And I think, you know, studies of, <clears throat> again, of hunter gatherers and humans, it's the men that go out um, and there's a lot of weird uh, uh, sexual politics involved with, you know, they go back, they come back with something they caught with the meat, who, which women do they give it to and all that sort of thing. So that's really well defined uh, in, in our closest relatives and in the hunter gatherer societies that men do the more kind of risky things with the occasional big reward. Uh, females have to make sure have a steady food supply so that their children can grow up. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It's uh, they say about like money managers, like women are get consistently higher returns than men because men choose to do like really risky things, but like sometimes it pays off big. Um, the, the, okay. So the last thing I wanted to ask you, cause we're a little over an hour here um, is uh, you were banned from Tanzania. Is, is that still in effect? Uh, yes. Um, so I, uh, as time went on, uh, I moved away from pure research and thinking about why lions cooperate and got more involved with conservation. And one of the issues that seemed very relevant to lion conservation was sport hunting, trophy hunting, because much more land in Tanzania is set aside as hunting blocks than it is set aside as a national park. And when I started on that, I was assuming that the hunters were doing a good job at protecting lions. They're a very valuable um, tool for conservation. Uh, and so I started working with them in good faith on all that. Uh, but as time went on, it became clear that any conservation they might be doing was hardly even secondary. Primarily, it was a financial, it's a business. And um, we began to realize that there had been serious overconsumption, that lions were being shot out uh, excessively throughout most of that area. Uh, we came in with some recommendations to try to um, minimize the impacts of the trophy hunters because in the long term, if you're thinking long term, you're not discounting the future, that you, you know there should be no conflict between business and conservation because you want to have a steady crop of lions that you can harvest year after year after year after year. But a lot of the things that were going on in Tanzania were um, acting against the long-term interest and more towards short-term profits. And so people were not um, uh, really doing what they claimed to be doing. Uh, and there was a lot of secrecy. Uh, and uh, I had been in communication with uh, the American government with our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, because the American government was thinking about whether the lion should be added to our endangered species list, which would prohibit the importation of lion trophies from various countries in Africa. Um, and uh, so I uh, voiced concerns about um, some of the bad practices that were going on that I happened to know about by trying to do the science and looking at the biology of it. And uh, the email that I thought was confidential was uh, released Ooh. and got back to the businessmen who then alerted the Tanzanian government. And there was a lot of collusion between the Tanzanian government and the hunting industry itself. Uh, they were kind of business partners with each other. And so they decided I should go. And that was, uh, that all happened like 2013, 2014. Uh, and, um, so I do not go back and I don't think, I mean, I did go back in 2015 after I wrote Lines and Balance to see if I could at least go back as a tourist. Yeah. And the answer was, no, I'm not allowed to go back as a tourist. 
And so I was uh, visiting what was left of the Serengeti Lion Project in 2015, and then I was told to leave within the hour. Fortunately, I had a friend with an airplane who flew me out, <laughs> and I have not been back since. Was, was this around the time of that uh, Cecil the Lion, where that, that dentist uh, got in a, a lot of heat on social media? Well, you know, it's funny. This happened just before Cecil. Okay. And um, so, ironically, um, it was Cecil who did more than anything else to get uh, everybody to pay attention. Because I was trying to get U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service <coughs> to, to do something. And in the end, they did. And they did ban lion imports from Tanzania. And um, to this day, they are banned. Um, likewise from um, Zimbabwe. And um, I don't actually think that's the right tactic. I think you should have leverage that if you're going to try to get a country to reform its hunting practices, you should say, okay, here's the carrot, here's the stick, you know, or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, but at any rate, there has not been uh, a reopening of lion hunting exports to the U.S. from Tanzania. Um, but that's really the energy for that came from Cecil because I'd been knocking on the doors in Washington, D.C., trying to get them to pay attention to this. And they didn't really want to know. But when Cecil came out, there was such a hue and cry that they did want to know. And then they did start listening, and it started making a difference. And so I think, again, when it comes to the message that anybody should know, not only is it not too late in terms of agriculture on this planet, it's not too late actually to get people to pay attention. And, you know, again, I'm kind of surprised more people aren't out protesting against all the craziness that's been going on the last couple of years, and particularly around the climate. Because, uh, you know, we did that in the 60s, and that did lead to changes in Vietnam. And the original Earth Day was a protest against all the pollution. And that led to the EPA actually having teeth. And it really did clean up the air. And so if people will act, it will make a difference. And in a funny way, Cecil, you know, all that shaming and shunning of a dentist here in Minnesota uh, had some of a similar effect. So yeah. if people will rise up and will speak out um, and organize, it would make a difference. I think that's a good note to end it on. Um, thank you for, uh, for taking the time to talk to me. And uh, I hope, hope you had as much fun as I did. <laughs> Yeah, good. Good All luck right. with everything. Appreciate it. You're welcome.